Like the coma, you want the, the annual to, to happen on the confidence test. And the annual is not a strict inspection. The annual is a walk down, and that's basically to make sure that nothing's freaky has happened. Air and that's the, all up and down it. Well, that happened. You want to ask about that building? Maybe somebody here knows about that building. That's right behind fire escape. escape. That's not a fire escape. No? I mean, it's not utilized as a fire escape. They build an interior stairwell. You're talking about full stick out. Many, many years ago. But now that brings up a very good question. That, that fire escape, which is holding all those ACs, needs to be checked. Right. right. For the ACs. Right. I mean, it's because still a hazard, yeah. It's still a hazard. So There's that. They're just utilizing it for something else. They should have put those all on the roof or something, but instead they threw it out there. But they threw it out on a fire escape that now needs to be load tested. Because in case there's a fire on one of those units, who's going to go out there and put out that fire? A fireman. So now you're still subjecting the fireman to basically get on these things to blow, put out an air, air conditioning uh, unit fire. It's going to be treated as a balcony. It's an exterior steel wooden stair and or balcony, then fire escapes, yes. I don't know if there's any access to it. From inside the building? I don't know if it's going to They blocked everything in. They blocked all the doorways in and they built that interior stairwell. We saw others, mm -hmm. other uh, instances where they were using it as a air conditioner the platform. Mm -hmm. That place right behind uh, Cafe Brio, where there's like an 11 foot drop with nothing, they come down the fire escape and it's a piece of shit anyway. And then you got an 11 foot drop where there's nothing you can't get down. Badness will be all over that. Oh no, we talked about that out. It's vacant. What? Is it vacant or I, I think, think there's somebody it's... living on the top floor? No, there? there shouldn't be anybody in McFadden. Uh -oh. And don't we, as far as the fire escapes go, if if it's in place, it has to work or tear it out? But as soon as you tear it out, this is what I was asking you, you can't tear it out because if you tear it out, you lose 50% of the means of egress and that ba basically that building is a dead building. So Nobody's going to gonna make it a dead building. Nobody's going to turn that building into a dead building. It hits that other list of yours. Mm -hmm. Correct. You have a, that, that dangerous list, right? Mm -hmm. Dubs list. Dubs list. So um, I'm sorry that my videos that I have with them, but I will have those up on online and in a sequence. So you'll have a this class plus all the videos I did with him in a video, and then you'll get Academy Inspector Training. Here we are in Lowell, Massachusetts. Let this load for a second, and then you have basically uh, the same thing I did with you. I just did with this commissioner. And um, just need to see a little bit of the so grade. We lost all our footage. No, no, it's here, but it won't play for some reason. It won't play, and because this is a Mac, sometimes it's a PC. Uh, I try to use my PC side of this, but it's giving me a little bit of a problem. So well, you could have seen the buildings that we looked at here. Are so I was not in any of it. Right. I was told uh, not to be so in it. Say last You're name. You're not a movie star. My city, Italian. Yeah, the camera. Works. There you, you got go. Face for it. We're here looking at you uh, did the commissioner. Or the mole. And we have a fire escape right down by our feet. <laughs> What's the greatest thing about this is we're going to be able to see all the rust and the connections. We're going to see all original hardware and squares. We're going to basically. He had a class today, and what we're basically looking at is a fire escape that no more paint is on it. So this is a perfect one because I can get my my nose right into it. And this is a perfect example of everything that could go wrong with a fire escape. Let's talk about this one. And then we're going to go look at these other ones and these other ones and a big monster that's on the back. So this may be a 10 to 15 minute video, but we don't. what is on here works there. So let's take a look. More paint and rust or more rust and paint. So that's all you need. Let's say they knew you were coming, Bob, and that's they painted this thing 100%. What are you looking for next? Original hardware. So let's tell, show people what original hardware is. This is a square bolt. Square bolts. Square bolts. And some of these, so now stay underneath here before we get on that side, Bob. How about uh, grading? Any pop grading of the spacers? So what that means is when a fireman or a person steps and your leg gets, goes through that, you get locked. You can't save yourself because now you're trapped with a bear trap. How about rusty tears? Any rusty tears? indicating that water is getting into the connection. How about cement blowout into the back? 
see cement blow off. Okay, let's take a look. Any damage from a from a truck or anything? Any any bends uh, on this fire escape? Okay. Yeah, hit. Let's take a look at the. Is it square heads or rivets on the supports? Are those original or they've been switched out in the past 50 to 75 years? No, they're original. Original. To let this fire escape rust this much, how many years? To get 100% of your paint off your fire escape. At least 25. Is there any paint that you can see, still see left? But even though the, there's no more paint on this, does this thing, which is older than 1978, have lead still in it? Yes. So it still has lead. Let's look at all the rust in between the connections. All this rust. Let's look at, let's look at your treads. Missing spacers? Yes. And let's look over here underneath. Better before you climb up above. If I had my hammer, I'd do a hammer test. Any rust in any of the connections? Rust in all of them. Rust in all of them. The bulge. You see all the bulges, right? Yeah. Is there any of them that if you were looking up straight up, can you see the sky if you look straight up on some of these? You look over here. See that one right there? Can you just look straight up? How about this one over here? See all the rust? Any of these bolts that are holding as best they can, any of them totally gone. Are they all suspect like this in your mind? This much damage. Would you it allow any of these to be welded in and, and remain in place? Because that's a typical it? repair. No. Uh, a fire escape of this size, yeah. now, let's, let's, repairing let's it is probably going to be in the eight to ten thousand dollar range. Replacing and taking the first one down, providing temporary means of egress yeah. while you put the second one out, so uh, could be twenty to. Twenty-five thousand to replace this one. So, and uh, how much rust? Everyone we looked at. Every twenty-five years, how long you got to rust there? Was it at least this condition or worse? Every five years. All these treads are quarter, three eighths, half inch. If I was to stomp along on these, you think somebody would give way? Downtown inspector. Some of them have been patched. Back up. This is a typical repair when they when these flats give out. You go. Lots of bends and smashes. I'll go slowly up this like fire escape. Right. I won't go too far. But you've got enough well, evidence here. The main thing, task force, the the main thing that's important is that if you keep this cloaked under an identification program, because are we inspecting fire escapes or identifying where they exist? Maybe they didn't. Is this a three to five year program? Maybe they didn't know what to look for. And in the meantime, if you get all the red ones out of the way first. Actually, I agree with this. It's like you just said, probably in joking. But I would say it probably is a, a group effort to get them all at once. Because you get word gets out that you're looking at them. They are going to be trying to get covered up. You get out there and get them all. This is going to go into a couple other ones right now, and then we'll, we'll talk about that possibility and what, how you should do it. Because there's going to be feedback or fight back. So there has to be a, a process so that you guys and still continue going uh, forward because this, this is about the occupants and about your firemen. Is there enough water falling on it? So as long, that's hard for somebody else yeah, to say, well, screw them. <laughs> when you say, what do you mean? This screw the really occupants and the firemen or just half of them? I mean, because right now they we have a problem together. is that this building has these two means of egress and that's a state code. So tell me how we're not going to deal with this because you know the mayor or you know somebody or, you know, so. So all exterior steel wooden stairs need to be inspected. Need a permit? So here's a wood one. Renovator's license? No paint on it. But they, if they can stain it, there's no paint. Um, how about this one? All exterior steel wooden stairs. What is this? It's a stair. This is somebody's. This is a negative. Hey, we're we missing anything here? Handrails. Handrails are missing. Let's take, let's take a look at that. There's water falling on it. They, 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 these are all metal. They, any, any bulging rails or. So all common like sense walkthroughs. What I do with him is all common stair. sense. But not really scripted, trail. it's just, you it's understand real. this, don't okay. understand, by the okay. third, fourth, I didn't even teach him anymore, he started getting, yep, 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 I understand, okay, look, okay. and we did far away inspections, right, from a corner, we looked at three fire escapes, that one passed or failed, failed, that one down there, way down there, and he's like, well, the camera was all busted up, yeah, failed, what about this one behind us, so after a while, from your vehicle, you can identify fire escapes and write violations. That's all you do. So whenever you have these gates that do whatever this thing is doing, so here I am trucks, at a situation where I'm locked away. I can't see it, but I, I have enough. And we were in a gated situation where I couldn't get in, but I could see enough. You know, you mesh this, then nobody can put their hand in and, and force the door open. So that's an easy. But it's illegal to lock somebody in a cage. Now let's talk about from down here. I can't get any more closer. From down here, more paint and rust, or more rust and paint on the entire fire escape. Mostly rust, so it needs a pinch up. Now, from down here, and you don't, I know you can't see to the fifth or sixth floor. You just need to look at the first floor. 
any evidence of maintenance, any shiny hex head bolts in this 50 to 75 year old structure? No, I see a mix of square head and rivets. Okay, square heads and rivets. It's rivet, it's, old. it's even older than square heads. 50 to 75, 75, 75 plus. years old, no evidence of maintenance. Is every connection on there suspect then? Any release arm on there? You can see that we'll let that cantilever drop two to three feet per second. So you're not sure whether even the cantilever... So basically, now you've seen... Now you've seen all the things that are associated. So let's talk about the low test versus a repair and what that really means. And I have drawn here a typical connection into a wall. This is what it looks like. This is usually 8 to 12 inches only into the cemented pocket. It goes through the veneer. And it goes into the masonry wall on these 50, 7,500 year old buildings. That, this, this doesn't go all the way through. It doesn't have a plate on the back. Every, every masonry structure, this is all that you got. And all of them, and you saw especially on that Monroe, this is already all spalling right here. Water's getting in, eating this. So what's the cure? Well, the cure is I have to drill these out, every single one, verify that they're good, and then repack them. In order to do that, I have to take the Farscape off of it in order to do these things, or work above it or work below it. But if I repack this and I just fill it in with cement, and down below I put a clip on it with an epoxy bolt, Buried 8 to 12 inches deep. These are three-quarter Hilti bolts. And is everybody familiar with what a chemical bolt or an epoxy bolt is? I'll explain it. What that is, is we drill a hole through the veneer, about three-quarters of an inch, and it's only that big. And that three-quarter epoxy bolt has a three-quarter rod, and I, you inject in there epoxy. And that epoxy, when I stick the bolt in there, it starts oozing out because I squished the bolt bigger than the epoxy that's in there. And when you put it in, you just keep turning it, and it basically mixes my bolt full of epoxy, tying itself to the brick and the mortar, and, because, and this all becomes one. So now my bolt is part of the brick and part of the masonry. It's called a chemical bolt or an epoxy bolt. So this is one of the options, okay? And that epoxy bolt has only one problem. It's temperature sensitive. So you can only install these for about six to nine months out of the year. You need good 60 to 80 degree temperatures, night and day, to put epoxy bolts. So sometimes I, sometimes I fix a fire escape, I have to wait till the spring or summer to put in the epoxy part of it. But if I don't have that kind of time or that kind of luxury, I can also take the very same bolt, drill my hole through the wall, and basically have it come out the back of the building, or the inside of the building, and put a plate on the inside, creating a sandwich. Whatever is easier and faster, because sometimes I have naked buildings, factories and such, and I can put these plates all day long and I don't have to worry about epoxy. Plates are better than epoxy because plates are permanent and part of the building and they get hidden. Epoxy has had some failures in the past, that's why duplication is the issue. So I either will epoxy every connection into the building with, a, with its own, or I sometimes use what's called a unification angle, and if I take this angle, which is a 3x3, three three, and I run it under a 12-foot platform, and I have six connections there, and I run this angle 12 feet, and every two feet I put an epoxy bolt, and wherever it, wherever it meets the angle, I put a bolt, I mechanically fasten it back here. Now, in order for this to give out, the entire 12-foot angle has to give way. So if I do this, I don't need a load test, because I basically just put in a brand new connection. This up here gets cleaned and, and sealed. We don't take it out, it stays. We will reseal this and make sure that the, uh, that the cement in here is all brand new cement. And a lot of times we don't have to take this out. A lot of times the veneer is just, we just, we just re-cement it right here. And now I don't care what the condition is of this inside, because my new connection is this and it ties it from here on. Now, the second place that we always have a problem on these supports, because everybody's going to freak out with you on supports, is the, the final bolt out here. And some of these come out this way, or they do this. A majority of you guys have this bolt situation happening here, okay? This huge bolt right at the end. The only way I can write you a letter is I load test this to see if that 50, 7,500 year old bolt is good. I must load test it. Or if I find that bolt in good condition, every connection that has rust must be cleaned. So for me to give you a, 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 a to tell you that a bolt is good, 
good to excellent is because it has no rust anywhere in it. But in order for, I can either low test, it, low test this connection at great expense, or I can put a gusset just behind it. And this gusset is just a piece of plate that basically will let me join and put a bolt here and a bolt here and a bolt here and a bolt here, and that stays, or that stays, because it's a rivet. Why am I going to cut a perfectly good rivet that the only way to verify it is through a low test, but when I can just reinforce it, now I'm at 200% of what the code required because I reinforced it. I will show you evidence of that during my repair because I have to sit down with you and give you a repair guidelines of what I'm going to do. And basically, you're going to have in my right up to you. This is an answer. Epoxy bolt the answer. Reinforcement is the answer. And this applies now also to every tread. This is a tread and every tread has this scenario. Look familiar to that black building there, the, the, the black fire escape? I'm just going to verify in my confidence test to you that I have no rust inside here. And that my bolt is a new bolt, there's no rust in there, and so I don't have to load test it. I will change the bolt because of its age. If this is 25 years old, do I have to change that bolt? Right? What's that? 25 years old or younger? Do I have to? Do? So well, there's even a time. Lesser size. Of it. Right. And again, you would have the right to say, I want to load test it anyway. But this is what you're looking at. Every 50, 75, or 100 year old building. And the guy did it at East Monroe. Road. They put on all brand new stainless steel bolts on the entire structure. Every trade has a new stainless steel. Guess what they didn't take out? Rust. So I got rust. And photographs to show you, because I have to. My report is not for the building official, I mean for the city, of, uh, for the owner of the building. He gets a copy. My report is to this guy. And I got to convince him that we have a plan to get this fire escape to avoid a load test. But every single one, I'm like, oh. And everybody thinks that if you put stainless steel here or you put titanium something here, you know what destroys a bolt is not the rust. I mean, it's not the... Um, uh, the strength of the bolt is not what determines is that as this jacks, there's ice jacking and rust jacking, is that when rust grows, quarter inch or grows almost to one, an inch of rust. As it starts separating, it tears whatever was in there as a shaft. So when the guy tightened these things, and they, I think the, one of the uh, handymen there said, oh, and they put a proper torque on it, I said, yeah. They put a torque on it so that it was here 10 years ago. It is here now, 10 years later. Every one of those stainless steel bolts has now been compromised. Which one is bad, I asked him. He goes, I don't know. He goes, neither do I. That's why i got to take every single one out, throw it away, clean out all the rust, prime it, paint it, silicone, shut it, put it back, and put on a regular bolt. Because do I need a stainless steel bolt to go back into a connection? Does it have to be tempered? Does it have to be a special bolt of any kind? All you're doing is holding a connection together, trying to stop rust. So that 50-year that silicone is the key. That if you guys get this task force or you get this thing done so that all, all the fire escapes are, get, fire escapes are getting refurbished, the owners of these buildings will only have to paint these fire escapes for the next 50 to 75 years. Only. Only paint it. Because rust can't get in with silicone lifts. So as you get any connection apart and you've primed it, Prior to closing it, you inject it with silicone. It's very messy. And when you when it squishes together, it'll goop all over the place. You take your messy finger and you're a runner all over the place. And you've encapsulated a connection that needs air and water to grow in the future. So now all you're left on every fire escape is surface, surface area. And will it rust? You bet it will rust. But will surface area hurt any of your occupants or, the, or any of your firemen in the future? Most fire escape uh, connections start, uh, or rust happens in a connection. Well, can any rust start in a connection that has 50 years silicone in it? So when you put this line in the sand, as you start getting these fire escapes back online, they will have a 50 to 75 year life. Will they get fire issues because they're, they're deteriorated? Yes, they will because surface rust. They haven't been keeping them painted. But don't you have that uh, one year, uh, will you pick that up every year if you have that one year Walkthrough. It's part of your building walkthrough now. If we get into here. 
Isn't that one of the questions? Paint is in good condition? We try to get realistically about every two years. Well, I want that we can get to most of the Well, <laughs> yeah, it's they can send us in. You don't have to be there. But he mentioned that there was what's your sprinkle testing uh once a year. Uh, there you go. I mean, but that's just there's a lot of different I mean, basically once a year. We have uh what we're trying to do again, uh, a couple of we just started the National Firescape Association. It'll launch in the spring. We're the founders of it simply because we had so much information that uh, as this information kept coming to you from Firescape engineers, from Firescape services, everybody's like looking at it with a crooked eye. So uh, we started the National Firescape Association and it's made up of members like you. So uh, all fire officials and building officials, uh, they're free membership to, for you guys to get on. But uh, the additional members are engineers uh, and architects and everybody and basically anybody and everybody out there with information and we hold the majority of it is going to be sitting there. So. Uh, if you go to nationalfirescapeassociation.org today, there's videos over there of classes like this that, so that um, people can basically get on there and just get their awareness up and so that if you say something they, and they're like, well, can I get the information anywhere? So we started the association to basically start housing a lot of this information and a lot of this will start being cleansed of our name on top of it and sort of be, become general public awareness information. When you, when you refer to one of these, and you've done all the framework, you've done all the supports, getting ready to paint. Do you uh, sandblast the entire thing? Yeah, the EPA was kind enough to screw a lot of things up for, nah, I don't want to say, they do a great job. Uh, they came in in 2010 and says, any fire escape older than 1978 is presumed to have lead unless you have a certificate from a, a, a licensed inspection, lead inspection company saying it has no lead or low lead. Uh, but they all must be handled under a renovator's license, that's all it is. So everybody, the EPA has, is, is issuing the renovator's license to all building, I mean not building, uh, uh, contractors, iron workers, and everybody must now have a renovator's license, and that's just teaching you how to properly handle the chips. So no, you can't power, you can't weld on these fire escapes anymore, so welding is no longer repaired, it means you can't put an open flame onto something that has a lead as a base. Um, thank God that 98% of all fire escapes are bolted connection anyway, so that's a great thing for us. Um, but you have to have a, the white suit on, no oxygen t tanks, but the mask, you know. And so when you're stri stripping it, you can only strip it, you can't power strip, and you can't sandblast unless you fully envelop it. And by the time you factor the cost of full envelope of a building and then sandblasting an existing fire escape, you can replace it cheaply. Mm -hmm. You got rust in between the connections there, and you, you get that rust out of there. How do you refurbish one? I mean, isn't it still compromised because now the, the hole is bigger or there's less Not at metal all. or something? There's going to be cases where the steel is going to be so thin you have to replace the steel or sister it up enough in that area. But no, uh, a lot of times the amount of rust you see that came from the two joint, the two connections being together, it only ate up a sixteenth or an eighth of itself and yet it produced three, I mean, a quarter to three eighths of rust. I'm like, my God. So quarter inch of rust will make a one inch growth, but it takes 50 plus years for it to do that. So by, a lot of times when we get there and we remove that one eighth, one quarter inch of rust, she's given very little up of herself. So uh, in a cross section, you'll probably see that the that fire escape is still at 75, if not 85 percent of the steel is still there. And that's why a lot of people think I have to replace fire escapes. 95 percent of everything I see gets refurbished, doesn't get replaced. So this is not one of those, let's change fire escape. But some people are changing their fire escapes because they have lead on them and their insurance is higher because they have lead. So a lot of times they say, you know what, get rid of this fire escape now. I'd rather pay the extra five, ten, or fifteen grand more now because now my building is totally lead free and my insurance is actually lower and in, in five years time I've recouped my cost because I've removed my lead. So a lot of uh, buildings that have uh, children, uh, Section 8 housing and uh, assistance housing, they're removing it anyway. Uh, and putting out a new galvanized fire escape simply because they have to keep it always painted otherwise they don't get their funding or their matching and they have to keep the lead down and so they say you know what they kill two birds with one stone they put a fire escape back but it's galvanized and it's uh, got no lead in it. Now it's open questions, open mic night now right now guys. What other um, what other questions do you guys have? But or, uh, Load test versus refurbish um, if you're out there and you see the rust in between it, no matter what load test or any engineer comes back with, it's going to be 
Yeah, yeah it no. has to be ready for a load test. And so that's the problem. Now, if you get a guy that says, I'm going to load test it anyway, because you will get some owners that will fight back and say, hey, I want a load test. Say, great. Have your engineer come to me and give me his load test criteria. And if he satisfies it, I will allow a load test. So the guy comes in and he, you know, he says, you're going to load test? He goes, yeah. Did you do your full inspection yet? He goes, no, I'm just going to load test. No, I want a full inspection so that you can tell me why I should let you load test. And then with your current knowledge, you're like, okay, uh, did you fill out the confidence test? And it says here, right there, that um, on, the, on the structural review, it says, um, all critical materials, connections, and or joints are 100% free of all internal rust or rot. Did you see that in the thing? And, uh, so you still want to load test it? Uh, your license comes from where? Tracker check box? Where? I think my question is more for the chief. Um, who assumes liability once we say, hey, this fire escape is no good, or we believe it's to be unsafe, but yet we don't placard the building. We allow people to stay in there. Probably the same people, uh, probably the same place where the liability is where the code says they've got to be maintained and they're not maintained. If, I mean, we, we if, we know it, if we're saying it's unsafe, or we believe it's unsafe and we don't... We're not saying that it's unsafe. Okay. okay, let's just... Let's just bypass the uh, the stickers and that. We're not saying it's safe. We're not saying it's unsafe. It just has to be maintained, maintained and inspected at this point. Just give us something. Just like we do the fire sprinkler system. We're not saying the sprinkler system is uh, good or bad. You got to have it inspected annually. Okay. So now it comes back. It is red tagged. Do you allow the people to stay in the building? We answered that question by May. We did. Remember. Um, you got a, a fire escape that is, is, is dangerous and the occupants can't use it and you can't use it. Immediately, they can initiate repair right away. They don't, they don't want to. Uh, it's on the foreclosure, it's a dead building, a little old lady, you name the situation. We, we talked about that as a worst, worst case scenario. You scaffold it right away. So for a thousand bucks, two thousand bucks, a scaffolding company will come in and scaffold right next to the fire escape uh, another means of egress with staircases in it. Now you've got 30, 60, 90 days to kind of talk and find out where this thing is going, so there's your meeting. You can also vacate the building because that's your right. If you don't have a second means of egress, you're not going to do anything about it, vacate the building. You can also order, uh, based on the situation, a fire watch 24-7 indefinitely until this matter is resolved. So fire watch, vacate the building, scaffolding, emergency repairs. And we talked about emergency repairs. So let's say he's got a $25,000 fire escape repair problem and the guy doesn't have any money. The vendor in the area says, you know what, I can secure this fire escape for five grand. Now, what that is, it doesn't remove the violation. But I'll answer the question. So if we came in as a vendor, and every tread that had all these gobs of rust, we took out, took out every bolt, didn't, didn't go any further than that, didn't remove any rust, but we put in brand new bolts. Is that tread safe now? Not, vi not certifiable. Is it safe for tenants to walk out and you to get in? Every support connection holding a platform had gobs of rust in all its gussets. I didn't clean out the rust, but I took out the I took out one bolt at a time, one rivet at a time, and I put in a brand new bolt. It's a temporary repair. Is that platform now safe and satisfy as a temporary band-aid? It's a make it functional. I didn't I didn't make it certifiable. I made it functional for a 30, 60, or 90 day period. Doesn't remove any violations. That's called an emergency repair. You would do the same thing for rails. Platforms, great, but that's, and then this is all under engineer oversight. The engineer is going to decide what the band aid is going to be to make this thing functional until such time that all the parties get to a table and, and work this thing out. So, fire watches, vacates, scaffolding, uh, uh, temporary repairs while the banks take over or whatever, because everybody's like, hey, it's not my building anymore and I don't care and whatever, but there's 50 people living in the building. So, we have answers for the, the, uh, the financial block that's going to come up that says we can't do it. So we have, we have some temporary things that we can do immediately to make it safe for occupants to get out and people to get in. I mean firemen to get in. Um, and then um, the, I don't know if there's any other piece that would come up that would, uh, even sometimes a combination of all three, fire watch and scaffolding. I don't know. It depends, it depends on the size of the building. But I can make a fire escape uh, functional. The last thing I will say, even though this, it's got engineer oversight, and it's under a functionality order, an emergency repair order. You know who's liable? The owner of the building still. 
because the engineer doesn't want to be liable while it's under emergency. You don't want to be liable while it's under emergency, but it became a, a situation which says, yes, we will allow a temporary order that only costs you five grand to happen, but the violation has not been removed, and the owner assumes any and all responsibility for the fire escape, even while it's under an emergency repair, and he will not hold liable the vendor, the engineer, and or the city. And this fire escape cannot be used only for a fire emergency. Anybody else gets hurt on this fire escape other than a fire emergency, uh, they weren't supposed to be on it anyway, so there's still placards and things that need to be put on all doors. It says, unless it's a fire emergency, nobody out there for a smoke. And I, I hope that answers. That's what they do nationwide. It's like, so how many times do we placard a building and people continue living there for God knows how long afterwards? I'm just saying before, I can already see it in Mike's eyes. Before he runs out there and starts writing these things, we got to start. We're yeah, you mean we don't? We can't just start going out right today. Answers. You got to have you got to have everything in place for you. So. <laughs> I already did. <laughs> well, that's why he's here. By, by putting that tag on it, the only thing is by putting the yellow and the red tags, so you'd have a local Kinkos print out these plaques on hard stock. You have a laminator here. You just laminate. Buses all have them laminate these, and all you do is basically you just put up yellows and reds only. Reds are for dangling things. And and if it goes red anyway, you're doing a you're you're doing a, a, a vacate and or fire watch and or scaffolding order anyway. That's coming. Um, so on the red. So this is really a three to five year program where you're going to go out and just keep hitting reds all the time. Your yellows are just going to go through the 30 days, send them a letter, see if they respond, talk to them a little bit. But for your firemen in the middle of the night when it's a smoky situation, they see a yellow, they see a red, they're not going to get on it. But as soon as they start seeing some of these whites. They're happy, like, hey, let's get on it. They're going to walk up and down because somebody said there's whites. And, and like you said, uh, but we need to know more that the, everybody needs to know that it's a white one. Great. So then let's put on a, a, every five floors, you must have a white. To answer Marty's question, um, you're absolutely right about them exiting out, like, the 12th floor. But uh, by the time those guys are at the 12th floor and coming out, somebody's already did a 360 and seen, have seen that tag there and it's going to radio. Seven to ten feet off the ground. It's going to radio and I see that there is a radio. It can be reflected, but it's usually white. Well, uh, it's a big white tag, you know? permanently, <laughs> permanently <laughs> affixed to the fire escape. It's, 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 it's affected affixed. on a lot of things. And then when you do your pre-plan, a lot of your pre-plans already determined that that fire escape is certified. Safety officer's got a laminated list, to-do list. That would be something you could add to that. But what, a, what about on the pre-plans as they go to the buildings? The, usually on the pre-plans, which is something that's already on your computer system, it, uh, if the fire escape is certified, shouldn't that be on your pre-plans when they're on, their, on the way to the on the way to the? That would be awesome yeah. to have one. Yeah, we don't really count on our computer systems. More Just going going to and from fires. Okay. You really can. It's too it's too quick. But on your pre you do pre plan all your buildings, right? Yes. So on the pre plan of every building, if it's a hard copy, the fire escape certified or not is already on there on your pre plans. Well, if it's done right, they could go on the dubs list if the thing yeah, is. I think not. the dubs list is a good idea, and I also think just that little checklist that the uh, safety officer has. And being on the dubs too. list is going to. Um, affect their insurance and yeah, there you, go. you you tell them hey here you are you're in black and white they're going to jump on it faster i don't think it's going to affect their insurance that's an internal document that is only if something happens that they're going to want to see that yes and it, and it, it does a, affect because as soon as you, do a as soon as you take it, it out of service uh it does it does have an effect the insurance company would do a FOIA on it uh, if just, know about it. just so you guys, I mean, the Dubs list is an internal document. Nobody even knows about it. I understand that. So, uh, just, just but as what a, I'm saying is, if something were to happen and they were on it, they could be um, not collect on the insurance. Just as a, a, some future planning coming from our side, and again through the National Firescape Association side of things, and we're trying to create sort of the National Firescape Reform Act of 2012. Can you imagine a class of this type? And you guys are not fire officials, but you're all insurance adjusters. And I tell you that 95% uh, of all the buildings you guys insure don't have a current certificate on file. And 50% of the means of egress is currently not there, and all the liability is sitting squarely on you. But as soon as you put a checklist item that says, I need current certificates within 30 days on all my buildings, how quickly what we're doing here is going to be a moot point because now the insurance companies are going to demand. Because right now the insurance com companies demand a certificate for your sprinkler system on file. Otherwise, they don't insure you. 
So there's certain checklists on, on insurance companies because they do the yearly walkthrough. And guess what's not on there? The bastard child of egress is currently not on that checklist. But as soon as they realize that 95% of all the fire escapes out there have not been load tested and or certified in the past 25 to 50 years, and they're assuming all the liability, they're going to put the pin back in this hand grenade very quickly. But in the meantime, we haven't gotten to them yet, but they are the final piece of the puzzle that once they know how bad the situation is that they're insuring uh, bad buildings, you guys are going to get that, that help. Because as you know, once you shut down the insurance, they don't, fire marshals scares me, but the insurance guy scares me even more. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because now I'm losing an asset. You know, I'm just getting yelled at by him. Um, and if I can delay him long enough with my lawyer, it's, a, it's court dates and stuff, and I'll still do it anyway, but I bought nine months. Insurance company, 30 days, cancels insurance. You don't even, you don't even have a breath with those guys. So we're, we're working yeah. on that side. Fire departments has got uh, limitations on how far they can go and yeah. pulling their strings. So but I, I'm letting let you know I'm working on that side of the insurance. I just haven't done it. We have to sort of get our legs underneath us because that's another arena that we're going to go into. Uh, but the laws are laxing. So the National Fire Escape Reform Act of 2012 is to do what we did now with Portland. It's a state code change. Because we've done a lot of city code changes, Actually, but it doesn't it affect the more state. Just state. If would, there's so many departments nationwide going to the IFC, that's one that needs to be updated. Well, if you know anybody that I should be talking to, point me in that direction. Uh, the NFPA is 15 minutes from my door in Boston. They're in Quincy, Massachusetts. Uh, I've gone to speak with them about this. I have to create a committee. Three to five years from now, all this will change. So it's a, it's a walk up a hill on a cold day by myself holding the only flag. So. I get a lot more results, believe it or not, I get a lot more results here in this kind of class than I do trying to change it from the top down, changing from the bottom up. It's just, if you guys want to do it, it happens. Uh, we have a nice form that I'm, I'm going to be sending you. It's called the Departmental Procedures. And uh, I was made aware of that by a state official that was in a, one of our training classes. He says, oh, okay, sometimes these ordinances, these departmental uh, uh, these these uh, administrative rule changes to your fire codes and these ordinances and it goes takes forever. But if you have a what's called a departmental procedures and guidelines form, and you use it just as a simple guide, and you have it as an attachment, to, uh, uh, and you guys sometimes use it on your um, policies, you call it policies and stuff, right? He goes, if it's general enough so that it doesn't specifically tell you how to do it, but it says follow these industry standard guidelines. That's it. So I'm going to send you a document, it's a one page, that you basically send out to anybody that writes a violation, because in one side it says what you're kind of looking for if you're going to inspect it, what you're kind of looking for if you're going to repair it, and what you're kind of looking for if you're going to paint it. And then at the very bottom, it has your code. At the very top, I usually snapshot your web page, you know, your, uh, the, 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 the um, no, your, um, your city website. I go to fire prevention and then I capture a little bit of the, the page and I drop that on top. I said, and then I put your phone number on there and sometimes your name, depending uh, if they want. So I put your name and your phone number and that way you send out every, and it's an emailable thing so that whenever someone's like, oh, why do you write that thing? He's crazy. He's like, Boop. Because now, if I may have this code thing again, um, are you guys going to stick to this code? Because I think your code from now on on every fire escape that you're ever going to write on is 1027.16. Or do we have something else here that you want to write? Oh, it is. This is what actually the sheet. So this actually will go now on our uh, website when you go to firescapeservices.com. We have uh, 50, all the 50 states. We actually just put this entire thing there. And that's what they're going to see. So uh, this is what you wrote the violation. So um, you, see if it, you don't need any of this other stuff. And maintenance. Um, Here's your maintenance code. So I'll start putting all these on on the bottom of that sheet, and it'll say, fire escape should be kept clear and unobstructed at all times and shall be maintained in good working order. So that's there's no five-year rule. You need to add the five-year rule to, and prove it to me, but um, sometimes... Um, Why do you need a five-year rule? Why can't it just be all the time? Um, no, it is always going to be the time, but because it's almost like either you, either you want the one-year rule or the five-year rule. Everybody in the nation does the five-year structural inspection and or a low test. And they do the one year like uh, Tacoma does. What happens when you have it must be maintained at all times. It relies on you to always remind me that my fire escape is not, not doing so well. So as soon as you put the five year rule, it's just cycle. It's a cycle thing. Now in five years, I need a new certificate. And when we put the, ta the tag on, you see the tags, 
have uh, tell you when the next inspection date is. Just like elevators. Yeah. See, month and year that it was inspected, and when's the next due date? So when you do your walkthroughs and you look up at that tag, which is only seven to ten feet off the ground, guess what you get to read? Big bold letters that say 2015 is your next inspection. It's a year from now. And because of the rule that you have, it says 2015, but you get there and you see some truck damage. It needs an inspection today. Which we saw about seven, eight. Yeah, truck bad damage. Ones. Bad ones. One that had a big one that cast iron disc ready to fall on the ground uh, by the bus station or by the tracks. Today. We'll get on. I am. As soon as the, <laughs> the the main the main thing the main thing that I will stress is that as you start this took 75 years to really screw up. If you try to fix it in 75 minutes, you're going to get so much blowback like you would not believe it's going to come out. But this is well, let's uh, let's uh, let's equate this to your sprinklers and to your elevators. Is every elevator in your city have a tag on it? Most. Every sprinkler system in your city have a tag on it on uh, telling you of its condition and when it was last inspected. All you want is every fire escape currently right now. So this is not an inspection program. You want every fire escape in your city to have a condition tag on it. There's only three colors you can pick. Our officials in their normal day-to-day -day walk around, as they run across fire escapes, they're looking here at the, this is my inspection today. But behind me, I after I finish this inspection, I see a fire escape, I have tags in my car, this is nothing but an opportunity inspection, that's all it is. And I'm not here to inspect it, I'm here to say, no dangling treads, no evidence of like life safety issue, I can only go get a yellow, I pull a yellow out of my car, which has already been pre-punched and I got zip ties, and I just go hang it on anything I can near the fire escape. I come back to my office, I write a letter here asking for a current copy of the certificate. I'm not asking for an inspection. I'm asking for a current copy. Or if at that time, while you're there inspecting this, you saw that and it's fully rusted, you would have wrote a violation on that anyway. So now, not only do you tag it, but you come back here and you're sending the owner of record a letter that says there's a violation on your fire escape. I need, a, I need a load test. So depending whether it's opportunity or not, you're still going to protect. Even that black fire escape or any fire escape that is pristine looking, you're going to put a tag. Because they're going to call you, hey, why, why you put a tag on my fire escape? I said, I need a copy of the load test. Looks like you just finished refurbishing that. I just need a copy of the, I need a copy of the load test. They're like, what's that? Oh, it says right here. Uh, I require testing or other satisfactory evidence. So I know it's painted, it looks beautiful, but I need evidence that you structurally repaired it before you painted it. It looks like you painted it before you structurally fixed it. That black fire escape is a perfect example of that. That uh, beige one that we walked around that had all the rusty tears coming out of it, it's it's that. So now you're saying, um, well, what's your satisfactory? Well, I had uh, Joe Ironworks do the job. I said, well, Joe Ironworks is not a structural engineer. So why don't you have a structural engineer now look at it and speak with me and send me his criteria and I'll, I'll determine whether or not I need a load test on that. But you do have a violation, you got 30 days. So if it's had a load nice test, and slow. Have you hadn't had a load test in uh, 25 years, you say? No. They, most of these guys have never had a load test. Exactly. We so, got to look so at every, I mean, we look if you can't produce a load test. No, no. Load test or satisfactory evidence, which would be a, 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 an inspection, a, a, an engineer's inspection report. No, no, I just called my own guy, Joe Ironworks, to come in. Oh, that's not, that's not satisfactory. So, great job. Looks like it's a very good job. But have a higher structural engineer to go out there and give me a, a structural adequacy report. And he may come back with, everything's great. They changed all the bolts. They did this. They did that. And, and they may have left only the tie backs into the building. You say, did you go in and investigate how it was tied into the building? He goes, no, I didn't. Okay, then give me this. Either go f go give me proof that that's still good because those are 75 year old and buried. Nobody knows what that, what condition they're in because a lot of times the water comes in. And this is let me explain why this is a concern. A lot of times the veneer has a, a th three quarter gap between the veneer and the roof water that comes in comes in here and rots this out. So the mason and that. The veneer wall, which is the pretty brick on the outside, 
The pretty brick is not structural, it's just the skin. But water gets in between the two sometimes, from strangest of places. And I never know what it did to the steel. The only way I can do that is for two to five hundred bucks, I can have a mason blow out a piece of the wall so I can see it and tell him, it looks good, put it back. <laughs> He's like, what? Whereas but for it's 50 a lot bucks, just to do that. Yeah, for 50 bucks, I can do these all day long. And it sets a new line in the sand because if I verify the old one, I got to do that every five years. If I put a new epoxy bolt, the average cycle of reinspection for load testing is 25 years. It's still going to be looked at every five years anyway, structurally by a professional. And every year by you guys during the walkthrough on that simple one thing. So you basically put Farscape back in line with sprinkler systems. And it doesn't happen overnight. Three to five years to get this all back under control. Because people are going to start fighting back. They're not going to feed back. They're not going to be happy that you're making them safe and fuzzy and warm all over. They're going to... They've never test. They've never spent any money. They spent fifty grand on marble for the front foyer, and you want fifty grand for the farscape? Are you crazy? But they'll change out that front foyer fifty times with, you know, brass and marble and this, but they won't spend one nickel on the bats of child of egress, which is the only thing occupants can use and firemen are using to get into this building or get out of a building in case all hell breaks loose. You know, walk. You're at five hundred East Monroe. Walk this way to the other corner at 518 and 520 East Monroe and you'll see that facade we on the did. front of that building that's about to shear off onto the street to kill people. That, I think that was written up by us. Uh, I know at least four years ago that, that one was written up. As Normally they would scaffold this. They either need to take it off or have an engineer tell them it's, it's okay. Well one of the yeah. things that they've done whenever situations like that occur is you minimally have the sidewalk scaffolded with a facade scaffolding and let people walk underneath the scaffolding for for the next five, ten years. Yeah. So that's the first. These, th there's these automatic band-aids, because that's a $500,000 repair, I don't know. But this is a 5000 a year uh, protection, which is scaffolding. And it's made so that bricks and stuff fall, they hit the scaffold, but people still have this tunnel to walk right. on for as long as you want, because these delays, and that's why we gave him the automatic, he, didn't, he wasn't aware of the scaffolding issue. Because you're going to have little old ladies, somebody crying, I don't have any money, a bank foreclosure, you name the, you name the excuse, you say, great. For a thousand bucks, there's going to be a scaffolding company here that we're going to order, that you're going to pay for. And they're going to scaffold this, and we're going to be able to get in and out of this building. And we'll just kind of hang out on this thing and see what's going on. But right now, you've got lots of issues, fines and fees and stuff, but, but the scaffolding is instantaneous. And that's only because I don't want to shut down the building or put a fire watch in here. And the scaffold is going to be cheaper than having a 24-7 fire watch and or have this building vacated and you have to put all these people in hotels. So uh, I have an answer for you. I think you just get on, just get with the fixing of it right away. But in case you want to drag this thing around, I've got a, a temporary answer for you. You know what I'm saying? And again, a lot of this video that we've done will be up on, I'll, I'll, I'll stitch it all together and I'll put it up online and uh, it'll be, uh, I'll send it right back to you and I'll put it on a disc for you so that you can use it for future training. But we did 30. 30 fire escapes, at plus minus, but all the big ones, we walked quite a bit, and we looked at everything, and uh, I don't know if he has anything else that he wants to share about that particular part, but uh, by the third one, I wasn't teaching anymore. He was just telling me, you know, because uh, it repeats itself. He's looking for, you know, evidence. Of See, I can retain. Before 7.30. <laughs> So I, I, I can hang out and talk to you guys as long as you want. Do you have any other questions uh, for me? And I do have to go back and do a yellow one there. What's that address, plus minus? Uh, the beige one. It's right next to you uh, where the old, uh, old yeah. Union Hall was. So right after this, I'm heading back there because I have to go inspect that fire escape because uh, it's part of the same 